evening, everyone. Can you get a respect unit off the stage? I forgot my, yeah. Or, or is it in my bag right there? Can you check my bag? It might be in my bag. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. Oh, please, please be seated. <laughs> forgot the most important book, the respect unit. <laughs> All right, I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. Hope everyone had a wonderful um, event. We had a one day event there a few last week, some, uh, yeah, just last week there, uh, this time last week actually. Um, if you were not able to attend uh, or if you did not see it, please go back and, and take a look at it. There's a lot of uh, great information, a lot of testimonials. You can see how the, the work of the Peaceful Solution, of course, is growing and expanding uh, throughout the world. And uh, it will only continue to grow and expand as we move forward. But this is a work that, that takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of um, diligence and persistence by all involved. And of course, we're going to be uh, picking up or continuing where we left off, which is uh, uh, the Respect Unit, Chapter 4. Um, respect and society respect and society which is where we're going to be picking up today now if you remember uh, our last class we actually had a great opportunity to um, we kind of got like um, usually they say double trouble or triple threat I don't know what you call it a quadruple you know thing a, a quartet I guess I don't know <laughs> but all all four of us uh, uh, did a split the class um, last uh, uh, Sunday uh, between um, uh, William, Chris, David, and myself, and we didn't do anything different. <clears throat> we just used that opportunity coming off of the um, the um, spring seminar conference uh, to kind of continue moving forward in this chapter, like I said, which we're in chapter uh, four of the respect unit. And of course, what we're covering is um, respect and society, and what we've uh, been speaking about as we move as we moved forward in the last class was going over uh, understanding society and culture okay because that's that's very important to understand <clears throat> and let's go back real quick I know we did read this the last class um, but we'll go ahead and and take a look at it one more time just to kind of refresh our minds as to uh, where our places are in the unit here we're gonna look back to lesson plan for page D and we're going to be on procedure uh, three there because where we're going to be picking up today, we're going to, um, we, we kind of finished on 87, but we're going to kind of pick back up there on 87 and then move forward, kind of just back up a little bit and as we move forward. And this is kind of where we, where it puts us in the procedure here. Now, before we go to procedure three, let's just look back really quick <clears throat> uh, to the uh, lesson plan for page C, just to refresh in our mind the purpose and objective of this lesson and this is something that as teachers we always have to keep on the forefront of our mind what is the purpose and objective of the lesson because if we miss the mark in the purpose and objective we've, we've kind of you know failed our students to some degree so <clears throat> it's important for us to go back occasionally really before every class it would be very beneficial to go back I mean if you look at this the purpose and objective here on um, LP4C uh, it's not very big, so it's not, you know, a, you know 30, 20, 30, 20 or 30 minutes of reading. It's very small because this gives us the, the direction, the goal uh, for what we're needing to accomplish, for what we're wanting our students to get out of the lessons that are going to um, follow uh, the, um, the lesson plan for the teacher. So if we look back there, it says, students will learn that respect is necessary on a societal level. So from what we've covered so far, we understood, uh, we got the, the foundation of what respect is, respect for ourselves, respect for others, and now we've got to look at what it is on a societal level. Because as we went over in the previous class, you know, we're all interdependent, right? We rely on uh, the activities, the interacting with uh, one another, and everybody deserves respect, and this transcends beyond just the family or beyond just your social circle or your friends at school or your acquaintances at work no it affects all aspects of society and so this is what they're going to learn because it's it's building them up because when they get out of this intermediate um, 
phase of their life, the 12 to 13 year old phase, they're going to just continue to age and they're going to get into high school. Some will, go, <clears throat> some will go to college, some might go into a trade or start a business or something, but they're going to interact much more with society than they do now. So they need to learn how to apply these uh, principles that they're learning in the Peaceful Solution in the workplace, in, in society, that, in which makes up their environment. Students will also learn that a lack of respect adversely affects society. So they're going to learn that respect is necessary and also that a lack of effect, uh, respect adversely affects society. So we're going to look at both sides of the coin in this, letter, uh, this lesson here <clears throat> because it's important for, as we teach in the Peaceful Solution, uh, we accentuate the positive and we eliminate the negative, but we do have to make the students aware of what's negative. How are they going to avoid it if they don't know what it is? But the focus is not the negative, it's just, hey, these are negative characteristics, these are negative traits, these are negative influences, environments, and so forth. So avoid these things so that you can preserve and maintain your positive character and move it in the right direction with the right environment, with the right friends and people uh, around you who will help and support your building, your development, and maintaining of a positive character instead of tearing you down. Because if you get yourself uh, around people who don't have the same mindset, right? The, you know, and, and we covered that in <clears throat> Unit 2 of the acceptance units where uh, we talked about children are at that stage in their life where they start to seek acceptance outside the home, well, if they don't know what to look for in a friend, then they might find themselves jeopardizing um, their positive character or allowing themselves to be put in a situation where they'll be devalued, right? Where they'll lose value because they'll engage in risk-taking behaviors that can, you know, take away from their their character or their reputation and sometimes those things are hard to overcome you know they're hard to get back uh, it's hard if you you know um, you know uh, got engaged in some type of uh, behavior where you know I've seen situations uh, you could just look on the news and you know look through statistics and so forth where people have engaged in risk-taking behaviors and alcohol and drugs have been involved in it and they have ended up on a sex offender registry you know, at the age of uh, 15 or 16 years old, right? And it makes it very difficult, or they, or they get some other type of record, you know, some uh, a murder charge or assault and battery charge or something like that, or even just, you know, getting caught drinking and driving or underage drinking. Some of these things can actually follow them for a certain period of time, which might make it difficult for them to accomplish other goals in their life. Might, they might want to go into a particular college, or they might want to get a particular job, or sometimes they'll... You know, employers and colleges will, will look back to a, s a certain amount of years in your life to kind of check your record to see if you meet the mark or meet the criteria to be accepted in that particular environment. And if you have a, a mark or two or three on your record, well, it might cause you not to be able to qualify. So it's important that we, <clears throat> in these situations, get it built up in their mind that, you know, as the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. It's, it's better to avoid these situations to begin with than to get in them <coughs> and then try to fix it, right? Try to dig your way out of the hole. So let's turn back to lesson plan four, page D there, and look at procedure three. And it says, tell students that attitudes, beliefs, and customs regarding morality, food, entertainment, and clothing are only some of the ways that one culture can differ, differ from the next. Have students read the section entitled Understanding Society and Culture on pages 86 through 87. <clears throat> That's what we were covering uh, last Sunday there in their handbooks. And it says, allow time to complete and uh, briefly discuss the exercise on page 87. Have students continue reading about the cultural indicators of morality, um, entertainment, and clothing found on pages 88 through 90 and stress that different cultures within our society are beneficial because knowledge, skills, and talents are experienced by all. Okay, So that's what you have to keep in your mind as you move forward um, in your lesson as a teacher. Uh, but just to kind of refresh our, our, <coughs> our memories there, 
let's take a look at our first slide here because we're talking about <coughs> understanding society <coughs> and culture. And if you look at that first slide there, this just refreshes our mind on what a society is. A society is a community or broad group of people who work together for a common purpose. Okay, They're working together to accomplish their minds are on the same thing and have collective activities and interests. The common purpose of a society is to function for the survival and benefit of all its members. Now you've heard the old saying, survival of the fittest, right? Uh, you know, I've heard the saying that, you know, um, you know, a society, uh, uh, they, they compared a society to like a, a convoy of, of vehicles, you know, and that convoy can only move as fast as its slowest vehicle in order to stay in line. So really, you know, uh, the, the society has to work to strengthen and build even the weaker or slower parts of the society in order for it to be strong and survive. Uh, and what we're learning for the peaceful solution, no, it's not every man for himself or every woman for himself, right? We take an, an integral and active part in being a benefit to the lives of other people. You know, we look for ways to help other people. Now, this doesn't mean going and, <clears throat> you know, giving a dollar to everybody you pass on the street who's holding up a sign at, a, at an intersection or anything. But what we're doing to strengthen our character and to increase our, our storehouse of knowledge, you know, sometimes just doing that and then uh, people have benefited society by just starting a business, right? Starting a business that uh, creates jobs, okay? Not just giving people handouts, but that actually creates jobs and, 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 and enables them to develop skills and talents where they can work and support themselves and, them, and their family. That's much better than just handing somebody, you know, a dollar or two, like we teach, teach a man to fish or give a man a fish. You feed him for a day, teach a man to fish. You feed them for a lifetime, and that's the goal: is to educate. That's why that's the pop, the the first positive character trait, because education goes so very far um, when it is beneficial, right? Now you can learn from bad things too, but you know it's better to to learn what not to do before you do it than to learn that you shouldn't have done it after you got into it. Uh, that's that ounce of prevention there. And then we have an example there of a society <clears throat> underneath that definition, and this is uh, the SAE. You've probably seen it on a lot of tools and parts if you've ever worked on a car before. And that's short for Society of Automotive Engineers. And then from their website, from SAA.org, uh, they give you their mission. So they tell you what their common purpose and their collective activities and interests are. It's to advance mobility, knowledge, and solutions for the benefit of humanity. <coughs> their vision? The SAE is a leader in connecting and educating mobility professionals to enable safe, clean, and accessible mobility solutions. So you can see there, you know, from that general information on their website, what their collective activities, interests, and of course, what their common purpose is. It's to uh, create some type of benefit, you know, in the mobility aspect, whether it's you know, uh, cars or trucks or whatever the case might be, all right? So that's just to give you an example of, of what a society is. Then we look at um, our next slide there under what a culture is. And, of course, these are definitions are, are found on page 86 in your book there of the uh, RESPECT unit. Um, but it says, um, a culture includes a shared set of attitudes, values, goals, and practices that distinguish <clears throat> one group of people from another. Uh, and then some examples we have here, and we talked about this in previous classes. In the Middle East, India, Sri Lanka, and parts of Africa, greeting, exchanging money, handling merchandise, and eating is considered disrespectful when it's done with the left hand. All right? And uh, when you do that, you know, that, that can be offensive to certain cultures in those areas. Uh, even in the United States, people who are from and still maintain those cultures that culture. Well, in Japan, slurping when eating noodles is considered acceptable and indicates that you're enjoying the meal. It is also thought that doing so enhances the flavor of the noodles. Now, the next time I have noodles, I'm going to go ahead and give slurping a try, you know, because anything that enhances the flavor I consider very beneficial. <coughs> but some places, <clears throat> some cultures, making a lot of noise while you're eating well, that's considered disrespectful, right? Um, and this is what we talked about in, in uh, going over um, 
diplomats and ambassadors, you know, a part of their job when they go, you know, when you're a, a diplomat or an ambassador for a particular country, uh, you know, being sent from a country for another country to go to another country, well, you have to do, they have to do their due diligence, right? It's up to them to gain information about the, the, the nation that they're going to, the people that they're meeting, because it's not just the nation. You can go to a society or a nation and there could be 20 different cultures there, you know, 20 different customs that people uh, value and uphold. And it might seem daunting, but unless you're meeting all 20 of them, you don't have to worry. You just have to worry about that one. So, you know, whether they do it or they have people who do the work for them, you know, they learn, they educate themselves about that culture so that they don't go and offend somebody. Nothing, nothing like going to, uh, you know, talk about peace, you know, with somebody from another country. And the first thing you do when you step off the plane, you offend them. <laughs> you know, you're getting, the, uh, you're getting off on the wrong foot. So it just takes a little bit of effort on our part. Even as teachers, when we <clears throat> go into a classroom, uh, a lot of times when we go and, and do seminars and presentations in different places, and we have a little time, especially when, um, you know, when we're talking to teachers and adults, uh, you know, not always so much with the children, but with, with teachers, adults, um, you know, administrators and so forth, uh, before the class starts, you know, we'll, we'll take a little bit of time and, and kind of work the room, so to speak, you know, uh, get a little feel for, you know, people and their backgrounds, their interests and so forth. You know, we did the same thing when we went to D.C. to understand a little bit about the people that we were going to meet so that, you know, we can uh, maybe refer back to it or, you know, um, uh, show respect in, in acknowledging certain uh, things that are common to their 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 area, their culture, their country. Um, or even things that they might like or possibly not like. So nothing wrong with educating yourself to understand a little bit about the, the differences in society and the different cultures within society that make people who they are. Because, you know, these things talk about, um, you know, attitudes and values. And values are very, very important. We covered a lot about values in the character unit. We covered a lot about values in the acceptance unit. And we covered a lot about values in the self-control unit. Remember, our values are a part of what makes up our character. Okay, so as teachers, when we take the time to learn about different cultures and their values, we can kind of see their point of view when they're interacting with us or when they look at society around them because your values will kind of help shape how you see society around you. Um, somebody who has, uh, you know, values for, for certain, you know, things of safety, right? Uh, and they go into an environment where <clears throat> it's just kind of um, chaotic, right? You know, they're not going to want to interact with that. They might be more standoffish. They might be more defensive. They might all the time be looking over their shoulders because they have high regard and value for their safety. If they feel that they're in an environment where it's not that way, you know, then they're going to be on guard more so often. Uh, some people who have kind of a careless, reckless value towards life, they're not going to care, you know? They're just going to just, you know, gunshots and bombs explode, and they're just going to be just walking through, you know, just minding their own business because they don't really care if they live or die or, you know, have no, um, um, I guess, uh, value for their life. So understanding a little bit about that will help you understand a little bit more about um, the way others think. Well, look at page 87 there because this is where we left off in the last class. <clears throat> And if you look at the paragraph there, um, the, the beginning of the paragraph on 87, it says, food and how it is prepared is one example of culture retained and shared by others. Food can distinguish one group of people from another. For example, hamburgers and hot dogs are associated with the American culture. Even after moving to a different nation, people from various cultures will continue using some of the same recipes to prepare foods as they did before migrating. <clears throat> and that's something that <clears throat> I've seen a lot, you know, that uh, not just people preparing the same dishes, but I've seen where even just food kind of brings people together. You know, uh, people, they'll, uh, you know, they'll feel a lot more relaxed, you know, if they're sitting down and you're having a conference and you're kind of having a uh, even like a dinner conference, right? You know, uh, certain types of foods and things like that can actually relax people. There's not, there's not many people that 
don't enjoy eating. <laughs> you know, some people might not, right? Um, but um, for the most part, everybody likes to eat. I mean, we all have to eat to survive and to have, a, you know, eat the proper foods to have a, a healthy body. And having a healthy body helps us to have a healthy mind, which will enable us to make proper choices, right choices, healthy decisions, and so forth. <clears throat> and food and understanding food in the different cultures that there are, uh, it's important because there are some cultures that, you know, they regard everything, you know, anything that moves is acceptable. Uh, cockroach, psh, well, wow, that's delicious, dip in a little sauce and chew on that baby, you know. Uh, but not everything that moves is beneficial and healthy. So as an educator or as a student of the Peaceful Solution, you have to take the time to, you know, uh, learn what is beneficial and what is not, you know. Remember, no is okay. No is okay. Just because you're there, you don't want to be rude, I'm going to go ahead and eat that, you know, slug, you know, that chocolate cover slug or whatever it is, right? No, no is okay. You know, I'm t I always tell people I'm watching my weight, right? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to... You know, getting to my um, my summer, my southern, my summer um, uh, work work jeans. All right. So we see here, uh, pizza, for instance, is a food that is popular in America, but is part of the Italian culture. <clears throat> pizza and other Italian foods have become a typical part of the uh, American diet because Italian immigrants retained and shared their culture for food uh, preparation. Um, so that's pizza now. I, don't, I guess it, I don't know if it originated in Italy, but you know, it's, the Italians are really known for their pizza, <clears throat> their marinara, you know, Italian type foods. Um, you know, one of my most liked foods, you see, we get down here to what do you like to eat on the lines below, list some of the foods that you enjoy from other, cult other, other cultures. Uh, one of my most honored foods is lasagna. You know, I just absolutely love lasagna. Uh, you know, I, I say that I can't resist a great dish of lasagna, but because I'm a student of the Peaceful Solution, I, I do practice self-control and I can resist lasagna. I just choose not to. <laughs> lasagna is very delicious. Um, if we look at our next slide there, and we just, you know, just look at some of the most popular cuisines in the United States here. Um, in fact, uh, and you can find a lot of this information online, or you probably know it yourself if you've ever um, ordered out at a time. Chinese is like the most uh, searched cuisine in the United States. Uh, and these are these numbers that we're looking at, these are the searches per month, with over 3.35 million searches per month of Chinese um, foods or cuisines. Mexican is number two, with over 1.2 million searches per month. <coughs> Thai <coughs> is number three with over 800,000. <coughs> Indian uh, food, over 600,000. And then Korean uh, dishes or cuisine with over 246,000. And you know what the most uh, sought after food in uh, Korea or South Korea is? Soul food. Right? It's, well, that's Seoul, South Korea. Okay, that was it. <laughs> That was a Korea joke. All right. <laughs> but soul food is another type of culture, you know, uh, cultural food, cultural dish um, that I value very, very uh, much. In fact, I love all those dishes. <laughs> you know, the right types of dishes, they taste really great, you know, if they're prepared properly and um, uh, you get the opportunity to eat it while it's hot. All right. So we see there, you know, these are some of the things that we can learn about, you know, different uh, or different examples of dishes prepared um, in different cultures, on different societies, and so forth. And you could take the time with your students to get them to list some of these things or just, you know, maybe raise their hands in addition to it and give some examples. You know, it might be a great idea in, in the class to, you know, have a student, you know, bring in their, their most like recipes, right? Bring in their most like recipes and they can do like a recipe exchange or something like that just to kind of make the, the class exciting and interesting. And you know, maybe one day at the end of the year or something like that, everybody could prepare a dish and we could all, they could all try it. All right. So just as a teacher, you kind of think of things to keep the class exciting while staying within the lesson and keeping your students engaged and wanting to learn uh, about uh, the, the diversity in life. <clears throat> but at the same time, incorporating what we're learning here about respect in that as well. Let's look at page 88 here because now we're going to get into morality, okay? 
um, morality, entertainment, uh, clothing, you know, th these are all things that help to distinguish one culture from another. Well, the first thing here we're going to talk about is morality. Well, on page 88 there it says, all cultures have rules that govern behavior and define what is right from wrong. And this is why we mentioned previously about uh, diplomats or ambassadors going to different countries, uh, educating themselves and so that they'll understand what is right and wrong behavior in this culture that I'm going to, right? I might be from America. You can't just go someplace because you're an American and be like, I'm an American. I can just do whatever I want to do. No, <laughs> some places will actually put you in jail for spitting on the sidewalk or chewing gum and spitting it out on the sidewalk or possibly even just chewing gum in society, right? You've got to understand the rules and the, uh, um, the uh, principles that they abide by and they, I'm sure they have a reason for it, right? They have things that they uphold and they want people within that society to uphold those things because they have certain standards that they want kept. And you know what they say, ignorance is not an excuse. You know, ignorance is no excuse. Officer, I didn't realize that this was a school zone and I was doing 80 miles an hour. Well, that's not an excuse. You're still getting a ticket, <laughs> you know? So educating yourself will keep you out of a lot of trouble. And education is not enough, but choosing to respect the rules. Remember, if a, com if a, com a country or a society has a rule in place that doesn't bring harm to yourself, others, and the environment, well, there's no, no problem with you keeping that rule. You know, if it's not um, compromising your development and maintaining of a positive character, you know, or causing you to do something immoral, then you should just follow that rule. <clears throat> Some of these rules, notice here, uh, talking about morality, define proper interaction between males and females. For example, in Western culture, it has become acceptable to date many different people before deciding who to marry or even if one should marry. Now this has been something that has really picked up over the last 50 years, right? You know, and I, I think about, you know, I, I don't like comparing, you know, people to things, you know, but, you know, just to kind of put it simply, because most of us have experienced these things, you know, <clears throat> imagine going to a, uh, a store and buying a, a pair of pants or socks or some type of undergarment that 50 different people have already bought, worn, and brought back. All right? <laughs> just kind of just kind of think about that. Let that kind of marinate in your mind a little bit there, you know? Um, this is kind of what you can get into when you... Because society has built it up in the minds of you know, young men and women and older men and women too, you know, uh, that it's just go out there and sow your oats. You know, experience life before you settle down with the old ball and chain, right? <laughs> they call it ball and chain. They look at, you know, a, a marriage or a union between two people as, as uh, something that's oppressive. Ball and chain, right? Uh, I got to go talk to my boss, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's like uh, it's made to look so degrading that most young people nowadays don't even want to do it. You know, they're not interested in it. They call today's society the uh, the hookup culture. You know, the culture where people are just going out and finding somebody to engage in premarital sex with. No commitment whatsoever. In a lot of cases, they don't even talk to the person. They don't know their name. There's, there's nothing, there's just that, and then they're gone, right? You know, how, what does that put in the minds of, of the young men and women in society today? What, where does that place their goals? Where does that place their thinking? What is that physically doing to their bodies? As we covered all the way back in chapter one, you know, the, the risk-taking behaviors that a person can engage in that can lead to premarital sex, uh, it can lead to uh, unwanted pregnancies, it can lead to sexually transmitted diseases, um, you know, and many other things that can affect a person's life physically and mentally, right? Mentally, some of these diseases that they can actually, over a period of time, some faster than others, 
work their way into the central nervous system and into the mind and affect the way a person can actually live, you know, their quality of life. So it's best to take these things into consideration, you know, and not always try before you buy, so to speak. But as we covered in chapter four, and we'll go back and read that a little bit um, here in, the, uh, in a few minutes here <clears throat> of the acceptance unit, you know, how to find a friend. And, and even in, in dealing with, you know, getting married, uh, there's nothing wrong with being a friend. You know, you should be a friend. A husband should be a friend to his wife. A wife should be a friend to her husband, right? And you both should have a mutual agreement and understanding that you're working to build a positive character and to put those positive character traits that you've learned and are practicing on a consistent basis into your children as well. And as they're brought up and the parents continue to teach these positive character traits, these principles within the home, and they uh, ex exemplify them, they uh, demonstrate them, they role model these things to their children, you know, not just when they're around the children or when they want the children to do things, but they put these things into practice, they resolve uh, problems peacefully, they don't yell and argue and fight and hit each other, and they don't treat the children the same way. The children, they're, they're witnessing these things, and these things are going into their minds and their brain cells. Remember the first seven or so years of a child's life, they're just I mean, they're forming constant new neural connections. Uh, <clears throat> and so by the time they, they reach seven years old, you know, they kind of have an establishment of how a family unit should be to some degree. Okay, not that they can't learn anything new, but it's kind of established in their mind. So if parents that have taken the peaceful solution, practiced the peaceful solution before they were husband and wife and continue to practice it, afterwards and then when they conceived the child and brought forth the child and raised the child imagine how much further in life that child is going to be having that not only learning it after they were born but having it in their genes as well and then they get with someone who has that same type of character and exponentially those things just get stronger and stronger and stronger. And this is how societal, society, on a social level, <laughs> societally, we can weed out negative character traits. And that's not going to occur in one generation or anything like that. But over a period of time, you can actually breed positive character in your children. You know, that might sound animalistic, but, you know, it's not. I mean, people have been breeding things into their children for a long period of time. Just look at these um, prodigies these violinists, these mathematicians, you know, the, the physicists and, you know, children that are like six and seven years old that are operating on a collegiate level because both mom and dad, you know, highly value certain skills and knowledge and they, they, they've not just valued it, but they have a strong connection, emotional collect connection to it and they put these things into practice and it's always on their mind and it actually gets forced into the genes of their offspring. <clears throat> And their children grasp hold of it. And their parents teach them after they're born. And probably while they're still in the womb. And they come out and they start working on these things. And next thing you know, here you've got a, a six or seven year old that's, you know, solving complex math equations. Or, you know, things that uh, physics have, physicists have been trying to figure out for years. Right? But they don't have all these different blockages and so forth in their mind. Well, it's no different with positive character. Okay, might seem far fetched, but it's not if we put forth the effort. You know, we can actually start seeing our society change and swing the pendulum swing towards peace if we all just work in putting forth the effort. And it's got to start somewhere, right? You know, the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. Uh, bringing peace might just start with this little group, but eventually it will spread. So let's see, looking back here, it says um, some of these rules define pop, pop proper, excuse me interactions between males and females. Um, for example, in Western cultures it has become acceptable to date many different people before deciding who to marry or even if one should marry. Well, I want to look back here really quick because at the beginning of that sentence there it says all cultures have rules that govern behavior and define what is right and wrong. Well, in our uh, next slide there, <clears throat> under morality, this is from page four of the self-control unit, number one, or chapter one. Under rewind and review, 
And this just reminds us of morality. It says, learning to develop and practice self-control on a consistent basis and in all situations is a long-term process, even in situations that involve interacting uh, you know, with males and females. The first step in understanding self-control is to explore how it relates to morality. Now, in the unit on character, you learn about morality and how to develop a positive char moral character. Morals are rules, and that's exactly what we just covered here. You know, all cultures have rules under the heading of morality. Morals are rules that help us behave in ways that are appropriate, caring, and thoughtful of others and ourselves. And in certain cultures, they don't appreciate people, uh, men, uh, behaving in a way that is degrading to women, or women behaving in a way that is degrading to men, or in effect, a way that's actually degrading to themselves, both men and women. <clears throat> They are universal in that most people, regardless of nationality or ethnicity, agree with and uphold them. Moral values define your character and your ability to control yourself. A person with moral values distinguishes between right and wrong and makes choices that will cause no harm to himself or others. Now, the only way they're able to distinguish between right and wrong is because they placed within their minds the knowledge that enables them to know what is right from wrong. Without that, you're left with guesswork. I mean, most people have a best guess in most situations, but without the, the understanding of what makes something right and what makes something wrong, as we've learned in the Peaceful Solution, it's a 50-50 chance that a person's going to get it right without the proper education. <clears throat> Immoral values, on the other hand, lead to inappropriate behavior that is disrespectful, inconsiderate, and even dangerous. One having moral, immoral values tends to develop enemies in crime, violence, and uh, abuse all stem from immoral values. All right, so let's look back to page 88 there. So um, we see there... It has become acceptable to date many different people before deciding who or even if one should marry. Well, then, um, really quick there, I just want to go back to the acceptance unit. If you, you can write down for your notes if you don't have the acceptance unit, acceptance unit with you, but it's on page 3, 63, not 3, add 60 more there. Um, and it's under the heading, Deciding to be Friends. Uh, and, and this applies to friends, you know, but it can apply to, you know, a spouse as well. If there is someone you think you would like to be friends with, is there someone you think you would like to be friends with? The following stages of interaction will help you decide if that person will make a perfect friend. Uh, then you've got four stages here. Observation, introductory, getting to know you stage, um, and the deciding stage. <clears throat> And all these stages are very important. Now, we're not going to go into detail about them right now. You can go back and read them um, when you have the time. But read them and, and, and think about them. Really think about them. And then think about friendships, positive friendships, that you have uh, you know, been involved in in the past. Or even just recently in the Peaceful Solution. And think of how many of these stages that you actually, possibly without even knowing it, actually went through, right? Observation, introductory, getting to know, and the deciding stage. Um, wait, look at number four there. We're gonna, we'll read that real quick. Um, well, you don't mind I have your book. But anyway, it says, consider carefully, this is the deciding stage, if you want to pursue a friendship with someone who is dishonest or cheats and steals. It is a proven fact that you will be known by the company you keep. Well, it's just kind of to some degree the same with, you know, uh, you know, the different cultures and, and you know, uh, spouses and so forth. Someone who lacks moral principles can influence you to make wrong choices. It would be wise to decide to make friends only with people who have positive moral character. And in this way, you will be influenced to make right choices. The decision to build a friendship must be mutual, right? And that's a key point to, to keep in mind there. You know, it must be mutual uh, to, to build a friendship and there should also be a mutual understanding and agreement on the, the maintaining of a positive character. Uh, and you should be able to see that after a period of time, the direction that that person's character is going, right? Is it positive? Is it something that's going to be a potential negative influence? Is it something that, you, you know, there's a 
lot of positive character traits. Maybe there's some personality clashes, but other negative traits what we can work with, you know, or eh, this person's just, you know, <laughs> some people they need a lot more work, right? Um, but it takes it takes time and effort on your part, educating yourself and know even knowing how you are as an individual. Sometimes people are more influenced in certain situations or by certain people or environments and so forth. So don't put yourself in a in an environment that you're going to be susceptible to negative influences or people who would negatively influence you. And it says here, with greater emphasis put on dating, there is a high rate of sexually transmitted diseases and births to single women. Um, let me see here. Let me look real quick in the uh, self-control unit. Self-control unit on page five. Um, it says here, this is under people need people who have high moral character. It says, uh, when your decisions and interactions with others always reflect the use of true moral values, you accept and appreciate that everyone has the right to live in peace, safety, and security. You can demonstrate a moral attitude by being respectful to all people. And we're going to get into some of these, um, the lack of respect that we see uh, in regards to this morality and what we're talking about in relationships here. This means not taking advantage of others, but showing them compassion and consideration. Did you know, uh, I'm sorry, immoral values in your decisions and interactions with others result in behavior that belittle and hurt both emotionally and physically. Name calling, teasing, bullying, and discriminating can cause others <clears throat> to feel inferior verbally or physically hurting yourself and others, or even just displaying an aggressive or violent attitude are sure signs of a lack of self-control. Did you know that in addition to displaying an immoral attitude towards others, individuals can also display an immoral attitude towards themselves? Choices that involve risk-taking behavior such as premarital sex and drug and alcohol abuse are example of ways in which millions of people devalue their own lives. This behavior is the leading cause of sexually transmitted disease, STDs, degeneration of the mind and health, all of which can lead to death. All right, so just keep that in mind as we look at the, the next um, information here. It says, it is also, and back on page 88 of the uh, respect unit, it has also become acceptable for marriages, notice here, it has also become acceptable for marriages to end in divorce if either husband or wife believes that they can no longer get along. And in a lot of cases, they're not even trying anymore, right? Um, something else has caught their, mind, uh, caught their attention or caught their eye. Someone else has caught their attention and caught their eye. And they've lost the admiration, the respect, or the love for their spouse and they think that the grass is greener on the other side okay or the relationship wasn't based on positive character to begin with so after so many years when the real character comes out right sometimes it doesn't take years I've heard of relationships only lasting three months before a divorce takes place okay um, then you realize wow, these characters, our character is not compatible. Most people don't say character. They just say irreconcilable differences, right? <laughs> but that's what it is. The characters are not compatible. Not that they can't be fixed, but they've got to have the information and the resources to help them fix their character. And there are a lot of places out there that have marriage counseling to try to help people reconcile their differences. In the United States, for example, over 50% of all marriages end in divorce and that statistic has not grown less over the last few years um, we're going to read a, a few statistics let me see where is that one at uh, okay um, well, let's look here let's look at my next slide here look at the dating game here <clears throat> it says there are over 8,000 dating sites and platforms worldwide so if somebody is nooking for nub in all the wrong places they got 8,000 different sites to choose from. In 2022, 366 million people worldwide use dating apps or dating sites to meet new people. 
42% of users of online dating sites are aiming for merit. So people kind of have the intention for it. But notice the next statistic there at the bottom. Only 13% of online dating site users got engaged or married meeting someone through a dating site. So 13% got engaged or married, which means it's probably less that actually got uh, married as a result. 15% had a relationship that lasted six months or less. 7.2% had a relationship that lasted six to 12 months. And 14.7% had a relationship that lasted more than a year. Okay, and some people, they just, you know, I've heard it said before, you know, they kind of just get bored, you know, they want to do something new, you know, new, you know, <laughs> they want to meet someone new or do something else, you know, uh, this person doesn't want to go to bars and drinking and partying anymore, they just kind of want to do boring things like stay home and, you know, raise a family, you know, and pay bills and eat food and, <laughs> you know, things that have been going on in building mankind for thousands of years now, you know, but, but people have their mind on, on, you know, gaiety, on entertainment and fun, 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 you know, uh, that that eventually catches up to people in, in their uh, later years and they realize that they've missed out on a lot of things that they could have done when they were younger. Well, let's look at the next slide here because we see some of these dangers of uh, dating, the dating game. It says um, <clears throat> the number of women under 20, 20 years old, uh, who are being sexually assaulted after meeting offenders on dating apps has increased significantly since 2016. Women under 20 now account for 22% of female survivors who are assaulted in this way, which is up from 12% in 2015. The proportion of male survivors, notice it's not less, under 20 has increased too from 25 to 31 percent in the same time period. So don't think, you know, men, you're, you're safe out there. You know, no, they got all types of things that can uh, occur to a man just as it can with a woman. And it's not just cougars, it, it's anybody. Every year, there's an average of 100 murders, 16,000 abductions, Think about that, 16,000 abductions, 16,000 people that are abducted and possibly returned or that are never seen again, okay, missing persons, and thousands of assaults through online dating connections, okay, and I've seen a lot of those unsolved, like, murder, murder mystery, you know, um, uh, uh, those, um, those broadcasts, which, you know, the uh, the, the, the roommate doesn't come home or the mother doesn't come home or she doesn't pick her, her children up from the daycare or the sitter, not the daycare, but the sitter, you know, only to find out. I know the last one that, that I heard about, the lady was actually, um, she, was, she was assaulted and she was chopped up in pieces and uh, put in uh, trash cans throughout the neighborhood, you know, and it was a man she was meeting from an online dating site. Now, is that to say that, you know, everybody on those sites are horrible, you know, because people were suffering those types of things before the internet, of course, you know, but this has just made it easier for people to connect, all right? Uh, our, our need to be social, you know, this acceptance, this desire to be accepted doesn't stop in the teenage, the ending of the teenage years. It can continue well into adulthood. But we can't lower our standards. And this is something we have to instill in our students' minds right now, right? They have to maintain a strong moral standard, right, and stand for something. Otherwise, they'll end up falling for anything. Um, the last bullet point on that slide there, it says the five most dangerous online dating sites, uh, states, excuse me, are um, Alaska, Nevada, California, Florida, and Colorado. Kind of a wide expanse of, of places there uh, for whatever reasons that those places are that way. Um, and then I wanted to look at um, the last slide there because this kind of wraps up this, this first paragraph uh, under morality. Uh, divorce rates in the United States, and this is what we just talked about, 50% of all marriages end in divorce. 40 to 50% of first marriages end in divorce. And then you get into the second marriage and you see that next, next statistic. People, 
they typically learn from their mistakes after the first time. 60 to 67 percent of second marriages end in divorce. I would think to some degree that it might go up <laughs> when you get into third and fourth and fifth. I, you know, I, I, I don't know. That's, it's kind of hard for me to fathom, you know, uh, people being married five and six times, you know. Um, like the one guy said, you know, I've been married ten times and I'm starting to think it's me. <laughs> you know, I'm starting to think I'm the problem here. You know, it's not always the other person. But those are the divorce rates. These are the, the these are current today statistics of divorce rates in the United States. I decided to go back and look to 1950, which I wasn't born in 1950, but I wanted to know what the divorce rates were in 1950. In 1950, the divorce rates, the average divorce rates for the United States was 2.5%. 2.5%. Today, it's 50 to almost 70 percent. What does that say for a society? Is morality increasing? Are people learning how to form friendships and relationships based on positive character? Or is the hookup culture taking over the minds of everybody? And it is a culture because they're, they have a common goal attitude and shared belief to just go and engage in risk-taking behavior without considering the consequences. Impulsive, irrational, harmful behavior to both themselves, others, and yes, the environment. We brought some studies out um, when we went through, I believe, the uh, self-control unit and showing how the things that actually come from mankind infect the environment, affect the environment, infect the environment, and affect the environment. The soil, the water, um, the, the, the air above us, you know, even these uh, microorganisms that come from even STDs, you know, can actually be found in the air, in aerosol above cities. Where are these things coming from? It's not coming from the birds and the bees, <laughs> you know? It's not coming from the dogs and the cats. It's coming from activities of mankind. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's great that we have this here on page 88, of the um, of the uh, respect unit under morality, and we get into that because you know the the stability of the family is important for the stability of the country, right? And and that all starts. It doesn't start just. Well, I guess it kind of does start with the family to some degree, you know. Uh, but it, it starts with educating the both the parents and then the children in positive moral principles, positive moral character, to teach the children to value these things so that when they do get old enough to make decisions, when they can get married, they're going to be looking for the right thing in the right person, okay? Um, but 50% end in divorce. And, and if you remember, we, won't, we don't have time right now to go back and read it, but um, in the character unit, um, on page 41, we talked about... Uh, the effects of morality within the family, you know, all in the family. And we cover, you know, in the section in there of how children have to, they're the big victims. You know, they're some of the biggest victims in these divorces um, because they are left with the instability that it causes within the family, the, the confusion that it causes within the mind of the children. And in a lot of cases, like we talked about abusers, people who were bullied, they often become bullies themselves. But sometimes children follow that same footprint. You know, they saw that their mom and dad, they were violent, they were fighting, and they were yelling. You know, they were divorced, and they were remarried, they were divorced, and they were remarried. Well, they kind of, that sets the stage for them. That sets the pattern of behavior. That's a part of their environment. But their environment helps to make and shape their character, right? These are factors. So it's no wonder why history continues to repeat itself every 20 years or every new generation because we're continually teaching them the same immoral character traits that we learn from our parents. Well, it's time for that tide to completely turn, you know, with you here sitting in this room, taking the steps to educate yourself to bring about a new society of people who value morality. Um, so let's read that last paragraph there. It says, some Middle Eastern cult cultures, on the other hand, have very different beliefs in terms of what is morally acceptable. In these cultures, dating is unacceptable and men and women are allowed supervised visits only if they intend to marry. 
And you know, it's it's kind of sad because a lot of these cultures they kind of get a bad rap, right? They kind of get a you know uh, hammered on by, for the most part, Western cultures uh, because they don't they don't conduct their lives the same as the West. But the reason that they engage in these type of <clears throat> values and activities is because they 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 value you know clean healthy bodies right they value um, sanctity and and um, loyalty within a family within a marriage within a relationship and I remember even the author saying uh, when he was growing up as a young man you know you you would not be dating a man's daughter unless you first met the father and then the father felt you out you know kind of picked your brain and his he wanted to know were you intending to marry my daughter if you were not intending to marry my daughter don't come back to this house you know because we're not running a brothel here you know uh, this is you know they were building relationships they were building families and and the intention had to be honorable you know as, as he put it you know it had to be honorable if it was dishonorable your name got around your reputation got around and nobody will let you nobody will let you interact with their daughters because you didn't have the intent to marry well in addition to this divorce is not allowed because the vows taken at marriage are expected to last a lifetime most people don't even hold those things to high degree they don't you know to death do us part well what is death you know you're dead to me I don't like you anymore you know we're getting a divorce and I want 50 percent of your assets right <laughs> no we signed a prenup <laughs> you know Anyway, they don't hold up, they don't uphold vows anymore. That's the, another thing that's lacking in society. Studies indicate that in cultures where male and female interaction is monitored and marriages are emphasized, there are significantly lower rates of pregnancies to unwed mothers, sexually transmitted diseases, and uh, divorce. You know, and, and of course, you know, with a divorce rate of 50 to 67 percent, you know, um, you know, I, I couldn't imagine wanting to go into a relationship. It's like the guy said, you know, well, I think I saw the next Miss X so-and-so, <laughs> you know. That's what they're looking at. The next female is the next Miss X so-and-so. They're already intending to divorce them at some point when they get tired of them. You know, and I couldn't imagine going into a relationship like that. But, um, you know, when you have high moral values and you uphold those things and you teach them to your children, then eventually, you know, we can start to bring these divorce rates down to, to zero, um, you know, if everybody works on developing and maintaining a positive character and, of course, finding relationships of people who have those mutual goals. Well, we're going to stop right there on page uh, 88, and we'll pick up next class as we continue there at, um, uh, with the rest of that. Um, next class will be uh, uh, 419 this upcoming Wednesday at uh, 5.30 Central Standard Time. We thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you. Everyone have a wonderful evening.